Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I hope all is well with you. And as you know, we're right in the midst of a political climate thing. I mean, things are going to just really get wild, folks. Trust me. Uh, I've been I've been sort of updating myself in terms of what's going on. The presidential race is going to be bringing all sorts of issues to the table. And uh, I would hope that you understand that this is going to be a very serious situation. And money is going to be really doing things that um, that we'll, we've never seen in politics before. There's going to be over billions, of, a billion dollars plus that's going to be basically spent by each of these candidates. So therefore, it's going to have a major impact on, on our local issues and things of that nature. And, uh, and I'm sure folks are curious to kind of get a sense of, well, Bruce, what, what, what are we going to do? When are you guys going to do something in regards to city races and state issues and state races and things of that nature? Well, they're going to come. But uh, again, like I said, uh, just, just be patient with us. But what I plan to do today is that um, I, I thought it would be of interest, if you will, to, to interview a person who I've had, a, uh, had respect for for a number of years because we've spent some time with her here at uh, the Oregon Voters Digest here on this particular show. Because as you know, the seriousness of, i.e., the No Child Left Behind, which I've talked about for a number of years, uh, because the Bush administration brought this piece up, and right now they're trying to dismantle it. I mean, people are looking for waivers right now on the No Child Left Behind situation. And um, uh, just recently, that those things are happening around. The, in fact, even the state of Oregon has, has actually requested a waiver on the No Child Left Behind. And, uh, and often we are into those kinds of situations. But I thought what we do today is that, uh, in fact, it's going to be a series. We're going to probably do about maybe two or three, three shows on this particular issue. Is it is that, as you note, in the, when you start talking about um, uh, failure rates and, and uh, fa well, failure rate, no graduation, and not attending the schools, and gangs, and this, that, and the other, and minorities, and, and failure rate, it always comes down to, quote, the city of Portland public schools. Anything and everything got me right around the city of Portland public schools. And, uh, I can go on and on and on, but I think we just need to jump right into this piece. But one person that I know that that uh, that's been that was in the was in the Portland Public School District, uh, Dr. Cynthia Harris is here with me today, and uh, I think what we're going to do with her, in all due respect, we're going to spend some time with Dr. Harris because she spent some very very valuable times in the Portland Public Schools arena. She's got the background, uh, she had the insight, she had the involvement. I mean, there was all sorts of enthusiasm there, and then all of a sudden one day, uh, she was gone. And uh, so we're not going to talk about why she was, why she left all of a sudden abruptly. We're going to just spend some time first off this first particular show to talk about who is Dr. Dr. Harris, Cynthia Harris, uh, what was her educational background, where she grew up, how she came to the Portland Public Schools, and where did she work, and how did she get to Jefferson High School. And we're going to do that on this first particular show, this first show. And then at the second show, we're going to get into uh, why she left. And that's, a, that's another different, that's another situation. And because it's very, very important. She's, she's in the area, she's living in the area, she's doing things. And so I think this is going to be a very, it's going to be very interesting. And it's going to be a benefit to you because like all parents, all parents who have kids in schools are very, very concerned in terms of what's going to happen with my child what's going to happen for, to their futures and where are they going to work in, in, in the environment that we're into at this point in time. So, so with that, I'd like to welcome Thank you. Dr. Harris. My How pleasure. How you doing? I'm great. Always a pleasure to have you in. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And we're just going to get right into uh, Dr. Harris. Oh, wow. Dr. Harris. <laughs> Dr. Harris, let, let's talk a little bit about your background. Okay. You know, hey, where, where from? Okay, so I was born in San Francisco. San Francisco. Okay. California which is still my favorite city in the world, okay. All right. <laughs> city of my birth. And um, lived in Berkeley for a while, Berkeley, California. And Where'd you go to school at? Um, in Sac elementary school, I yeah, uh, yeah. went to North Avenue Elementary School in Sacramento. Del Paso Junior High on the north side and Gretna Union High I graduated from Gretna Union High School. How'd you do in high school? And what were you doing? In How did I do in high school? I was an um, honor roll student most of the time. I um, 
didn't live up to my potential in high school, mm-hmm. I, but I was a student officer and very active in community. So I would say the thread that follows me throughout my lifetime is community mm-hmm. engagement. Mm-hmm. And I was actually um, told I'd be a good secretary, so I took a mm-hmm. lot of those secretarial skills and I was mm-hmm. like the fastest typist in my high school. Mm-hmm. And um, it wasn't until I went into my first and second year of college that I really saw that I had potential and I remember the professor um, saying to me, you know, I think you can do well. I mean, I, w- I think I was kind of like the students are today, a little bit nonchalant, not mm-hmm. so motivated and uh, became part of a teacher core program, mm-hmm. which uh, they really focus in on getting, making sure you're into the college. And I was at San Francisco State mm-hmm. for my bachelor's degree and for my, I have a master's degree in counseling. I got that at San Francisco State. So I absolutely love uh, San Francisco State and the teachers and professors that I had at the time. Mm-hmm. They were really, really good. Well, you know, doing your stay in, well, doing your stay one in high school and whatever, was communication skills a, a very key element in terms well, of Well, yeah, I was actually a debater. I don't really okay. talk oh, that great, much about great, that. Great. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I was a debater, and uh, I absolutely love speech. Actually, my degree is in speech, and I mm. sometimes I forget that. Mm. But, yeah, um, I actually love giving speeches. You know, I'm a motivational speaker, and I don't do a lot of it, but I absolutely love it. And one of the skills that... I know I bring to the community when I work with them is I inspiration. I want to inspire them. I want to know what's holding them back. <laughs> and I also want to um, build up the environment. One of the key things I've been doing in low achievement schools is looking at the environment that you have to live and work in and how mm-hmm. can we make it better and who mm-hmm. can come and help us. Mm-hmm. So then we go from there to looking at partnerships, people who can help us make this better. So yeah, I would say giving voice to that, giving voice to myself has been a very important part of my life. I've you know, served on reading, numerous committees. And, and I'm doing sure you that. I'm sure this will probably bring up bring things up in your in your own mind says that I can I can think about the time when I was going to school. Comprehensive yeah. reading was it wasn't just reading. Yeah, comprehensive. It was comprehensive. Yeah. That was very heavy during that particular mm-hmm. time, writing papers and things of that nature, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That did help you, I take it when Oh, uh, absolutely. You know, preparing for debates, you have to do a lot of research and one of the skills I think I really do have is I really do process and study everything. Everything is procedure for me. And I study it for a long time, you know, and try and get it right and understanding angles. I think I would have been a good lawyer because I like to do that and I work really hard at it. And I think those critical thinking skills are so important and understanding people. And I mentor youth today. And my, I have a mentee with a program called Step It Up. Her name is Rosalia Medina. And she says, how do you learn how to read people? Because when I talk to her, she thinks I'm reading her. Mm-hmm. I don't see it like that. I just know certain things lead to certain results, right? So I do love that so much, is the research and the study. And even studying the issues that are going on right now here in Oregon, mm-hmm. I love that. I keep all the articles and, you know, I just want to understand, you know, like what goes on in this city. Well, you know, as a debater, as you were saying, you know, that's sort of in- instinctively, you know what I mean? You yeah. just get right into it, you know, yeah. automatically. You're constantly looking at folks and weighing yeah. folks. and that, I-, I do it all the time. Yes, yeah. right, 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 right. Well, okay, now that now you've graduated from college, you've, you've got your degree. Yeah. Okay, so where do you go from there? So um, with the program I was working with, um, I applied for a job in Oakland, and I was, they had like, I guess a hundred people applying for this job at a, I was a school in a minority area called West Oakland, mm-hmm. and it was called Martin Luther King Elementary, and I became one of the three new teachers they hired really? in the early part of the yeah mm-hmm. in the seventies, and um, it was open pop in the classroom. So I was in the classroom with uh, second and third graders, wow. which I absolutely wow. loved, and I loved the school because it was right in the heart of the community. So I, when I look at my life, I am really a person who likes to make a difference on the ground. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I had a summer school principal one year that took me to the year-round school, and that's where I stayed for eight years, and that was my first principalship, was Perel to year-round. And that came from the community. I had my administrative credential, but I wasn't really thinking about being a principal. But the community, they asked the assistant superintendent if I could be their principal, and that's how I got my first really? principalship. Principalship, yeah. doing that particular time? Yeah. Wow, yeah. wow. It was in the early 80s. And what what, did, what were you learning? What did you learn during that during those classrooms? Well, First the in classroom, the classroom, the I I really saw the poor achievement of the black males. So I've always been interested in working with black males around reading, feeling good about themselves, and acknowledgement. And 
working together and and dealing with the anger that mm. for some reason so what they did you answer, what did you answer so what did i institute yeah. during that time was peer tutoring peer tutoring kids helping kids and okay. uh, tribes where the kids work in groups a lot mm -hmm. and team learning so a lot of collaborative work is what i did and a lot of self-esteem and motivation and individualization i really remember i had one little boy named randy and i guess Randy and his buddies were the smartest kids in the world. Mm -hmm. They were second and third graders reading almost on junior high level. Mm -hmm. And they had their own box of reading materials and they read through it and, asked, and had contractual agreements. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of individual learning back in those days, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of um, really parent conferences, student conferences and things like that. Mm -hmm. Those were strategies that were uh, appropriate at the time. Some of them are appropriate today. Mm -hmm. but definitely appropriate at that time. Now, now that you're a principal, I take it you were probably still sensitive to some of the things that you were in the classroom. Yeah, I was there, definitely right? sensitive. Um, I was young, definitely sensitive to the community. I was on par with the community. Um, again, it seemed like all my life I'm around schools that are going to close, but they were going to close busy. that, very that busy school. Minded. It was a, a year-round school. And, very busy and they managed to expand the year-round that mm -hmm. year, and then years later they closed that concept down. But um, I absolutely loved the year-round concept. You mm -hmm. worked so many weeks on and so many weeks off. Mm -hmm. And it, it was close to the University of California, so there was oh, wow. university right. engagement right. going on. And there were a lot of young parents that were very active in, in social issues, civil mm -hmm. rights. And one of my parents became a county superintendent and mm -hmm. is a county superintendent to this day. Mm -hmm. That's Sheila Jordan. Mm -hmm. And so they were very active. Um, some of the parents served on city council. Mm -hmm. So my parents were um, movers and shakers of their time. Really? Yes, really? absolutely. Well, tell me this now. When you were principal, did you institute, if you will, some of your ideas that you had learned, if you will, in the classroom to, yeah. your, to your teachers, to the folks who were Yeah, one were, of the things um, that I institute that's hard to, for me when I don't see it working is as process. Like when we hired a teacher, we really work with the community and the teachers and the students on the hiring process, so the community engagement and the involvement, lots of involvement. And then assessments and evaluations to the community went mm -hmm. out on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So there was some really cool, th and then the library, I would just remember having a program called Host in the Library where you assess the students with the books they read and they take tests and they can move themselves up the ladder mm -hmm. with the program. Mm -hmm. So, and working with a number of people like an evaluator, a person who worked in the library that taught reading, very specific kinds of skills. So I think those are some of the things that mm -hmm. I would say I took with me. I got you. Okay. Well, tell me, let's go back for a moment. When you, so when you got your degree, mm -hmm. i.e. the teacher certificate. I oh, the teacher the certificate. certificate. You okay. picked that up, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I think about, do you feel you were equipped after you've gotten that, now you, I mean, saying now you're you mean in, to be a principal, to be a principal, and, and to I don't be, know, to, and to have been a teacher, <laughs> and to have been a teacher. Uh, you know, um, I mean, going in the classroom. I, now, you know, I don't I'm, really know minority because, issues, all that. Yeah, kind of because stuff. at that school there were still issues that we have today here in Oregon. Not, mm -hmm. not enough minority teachers, not enough uh, minority parent involvement, not enough money. Uh, some of the issues of that day are issues that are still present. Mm -hmm. I was, um, I think I've always been a fundraiser. So I remember bringing in a $225,000 grant to that school and lots of smaller grants. I work with the parents to do, redo all of the... Are, you, um, are we back in California? We're back in California. Okay, okay. Um, playground equipment. And that mm -hmm. was parent engagement, you mm -hmm. know, that did mm -hmm. that. So I think I did have... Um, some similar issues in the classroom. I learned how to work with the Marcus Foster Institute. We mm -hmm. had many grants. And I sat on that committee for more than 10 years helping teachers with, with grants and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think I brought some of what I had in the classroom to the wider arena. Yeah, but I, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, when you when you were going, pursuing your degree uh -huh. in that arena and getting that teacher certificate, yeah. was that part of the curriculum? Uh, in, in yeah, the, you have to have the teaching cred credential to no, actually but the teacher, teach. In, in our, in my point is, when you were going to school, uh -huh. when you were getting your degree, getting your degree, mm -hmm. did they, did you feel that they equipped you to be a very effective teacher well, in the classroom? Well, that's a hard question. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say yes. And okay. the reason I would say yes is because I was with the Teacher Corps program that was in the schools for two years as a team, and we worked in the schools. Okay. And we had the current strategies and techniques, and we worked in the school of the district was, was going to hire us. Okay. Okay. And we had a team leader who was there with us, and we taught students. 
And then as we wove in into getting our credentials, then they hired most of us. So I would say yes. Okay. But yes from the standpoint of saying this is after you got your, 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 your t- teachers. You no, it would be before. It was creativity, before, right? But it was, I would say yes. You taught that in the classroom and yeah, while we you had to, your degree? Yeah, we had, oh, okay. remember we had a team of teachers and we had a long internship. Oh, okay. With okay, that particular okay. So program you were still at in that school. time. You were still in still school. Still taking classes, teaching part of the day, and then doing parent engagement okay, in the evening. Okay. So I would say yes, but not. I wouldn't say the mastery or the efficiency was a 10. Yeah, okay. I would say we might be a 7.5 mm-hmm. or an okay. 8 or something okay. like that on a scale of 1 to 10. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But dealing with uh, all ethnic minorities yes, and, absolutely. and folks across the board, you got that while pursuing yes, your, absolutely. your teacher's mm-hmm. okay, And I think it was during those times that I became so committed to urban education oh, okay. because of that. Oh, okay. And then there were uh, some urban organizations that embraced us as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you know, I've been really thinking about that, you know, like, why am I so dedicated and committed mm-hmm. to this? It's because I think I, that commitment come at an early age. I think it even come at a younger, mm-hmm. when I was doing peer tutoring in elementary okay. school, I was a peer okay. tutor myself mm-hmm. at my school. And I worked with the my sixth grade, my fifth grade teacher who then became the principal of the school where I, I was. Okay. So I think I, I had this as a child, okay. you know, this willingness to help. And um, commitment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I do. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, you know you you you're principal. Yeah. And you you've done a number of things mm-hmm. there at the particular time. Now you're still in California. Yeah. So all of a sudden, when when did you pursue your your PhD? Oh, okay. So um, I was doing really well at uh, Peralta, and Elizabeth Lawrenson, who was one of the older school board members, she said, "I want you promoted." And she went to the superintendent, who was Joe Cotto, and he one day just pulled me out the school, and I became the director of staff development. So I spent five years of director of staff development over the mentor teachers and new teacher projects and piloted those programs. Mm-hmm. And then um, it was during that time that um, someone came to our district that was really looking for some students who wanted to study for it. I think that was the time. Mm-hmm. In mid '80s, I guess that I started working on that. I wanted to refine my craft a little more. I'm really always seeking for mastery mm-hmm. and doing it well. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's when I started. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a group of about, I don't know, maybe 30 people in the Bay Area that mm-hmm. was at studying okay. at that time, okay. of which about 18 of us graduated. And your thesis? Then? Well, um, at our university, which is Nova Southeastern. Uh, we had to do practicums, which are problems that you ask questions and you have to do like large reports on these. So I had three of them. One was about um, staff development and um, working with parents. So that was, mm-hmm. so I guess parent involvement, of course, you know, that's my theme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then one of them was on developing peer tutoring programs, which I still do today. Mm-hmm. I was called back to California just last year to help Bob Schwartz put together a de- more depthful program for peer tutoring. You know, I've helped put that before. I've helped institute 30 programs in wow. the state of California. Yeah. So, and I still do that. I was called back by the Urban Strategies and the by Robert Schwartz Advisory Committee to do that. So I still do that you to this day. Today. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Thank okay, you. well, well, we'll, we'll kind of like jump now a bit. In okay, to, go ahead and jump. You got your PhD <laughs> and whatever. What how'd now? You, <laughs> how'd you get to Portland, Oregon? Okay, so um, how did that develop? I have a couple more jumps before I okay, get to that. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So um, yeah, I went uh, to the district office and I had several jobs there, and they always have these shakeups. So then I was sent back to where I started my career to be principal, and I had to go back to Peralta because it wasn't doing well, and that, I see that throughout my career. Troubleshooting now. Yeah, so I troubleshoot. I went there for a year, and then okay. and they're still going strong, good achievement, and everything to this day. Then I went to the next school where I had been, Martin Luther. King and I stayed there three years then my mother got sick and I took off and did a nonprofit, help other people evolve for about two years and after my mom passed I went back to work because I had taken off and I went to a different school district so I had been 27 years in the Oakland public schools which is my greatest love and um, I worked in a transition department for two years I interviewed I was just looking for work (laughs) and they needed me and so I did that for two years and then I became a coordinator of coaches in um, the West Contra Costa Unified School District and I ran the magnet program and then one of the principals left at Nystrom Elementary and that's when I soared again. I took a, the, one of the lowest achievement schools and we zoomed wow, in three really, or four years really. and then I met Barbara Adams and then she was my boss who I really love and she was working on her doctorate at Harvard and then she came to Oregon and 
I think she recruited me. Somehow my name Who's was this now? Barbara Adams, and okay. she was working directly with Vicki Phillips, and I interviewed. Okay. I was asked to come and interview. I was superintendent. She was the superintendent at the time, which I admire and love her, too. She's now a director of education in, in the Gates Foundation. I'm not sure what Barbara Adams is doing now. Okay. But um, I interviewed, and I was so excited, and I came here as area superintendent. Area superintendent, mm -hmm. which oh, means? I was over 24 schools in the Jefferson Cluster and the Southwest. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then uh, there, the principal left, who was Mr. Dudley, he stayed maybe eight months. He was hired by a team of people here in Portland. And then I was asked to stay at, temporarily at Jefferson, and then I got the re regular appointment. So I stayed there about three years. And for two, one of those, two of those years, I was the area superintendent as well as the... Um, principal okay okay now as you were supervising this cluster if you yeah will, I take it you probably saw uh, you had the insight in terms of what were some of the issues right well um you know it take you a little while to really see what the issues are. Okay. you have to embrace what's going okay. on and see where people are but I would say yes I knew some of the issues but probably mm -hmm. not all but you were supervising uh, principal Dudley though at the time right Yes, I was. Okay, he was. Mm -hmm. okay, so, and he'd been, what did about six, seven months? I think he was there eight months. About eight months mm -hmm. or whatever. Any, any, what's the problem? Was there a problem there? Well, I think um, a couple of things I'd like to say about uh, newcomers to Oregon. I mm -hmm. think we have systems that we come out of that we are very familiar with. For mm -hmm. example, me coming in California, I had 30 years of a whole different kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's enough of a, a training or a, a mentoring that happens coming into a new system. Mm -hmm. I would say... I, I would think for Mr. Dudley it would be the same way. You you have a way, and, right. and there's no change on the staff. Right. Everybody's the same, and they just put you in there, mm -hmm. and that's kind of hard. So I think um, it was culture shock probably for Mr. Dudley. I think he's very smart. I think um, he definitely was a mover and a shaker. Um, it's just the but way a, it was. But, but in another village. Yeah, it was in, we all in another village, and we don't know these new villages, <laughs> right. right? We don't know where the bones are buried. We don't know it, where the landmines are. We don't know where the political base is. Right. You can watch all day long, but not until you get into action, what do you know where the landmines mm -hmm. are? And and one of the things I saw in my own leadership was not a lot of authority was given, you mm -hmm. know? So um, sometimes people want to figurehead, and they forget to tell you that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would say... A lot of it is the training, the mentoring, the feedback in a timely way, and the acknowledgement in a timely way, and that would make the transition better. Right. Or if you don't want newcomers, you shouldn't right. invite them to the village. Right. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> so there you have it. Right, right. right. Well, mm -hmm. tell me this, Dr. Harris. Now, what, 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 what have you? What did you learn? Oh, with, I learned the a time lot. That you were there at Jefferson High School, and and maybe and spend a little time in talking from the standpoint that. Uh, Folks were very concerned, if you will, about the failure rates mm -hmm. and this, this, that, and the other. How did you how did you deal with that? Well, before I ever came to Oregon, one of the things I did do was I looked at a lot of articles for the last six months of things that had happened. So I was mm -hmm. aware of some of the situations, but it's nothing Still, like no, getting no, in there yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can yeah, read all right. day long. I, heard that. I read every report I that I could get my hands <laughs> on. I had did. a friend that lived here in Oregon that pulled up a lot of the newspaper right, articles right, for me. Right, right. And I would still say it's nothing like getting in there yourself. And I don't know, things that have not gone well w for w Was there a welcoming committee that you could access to that would sit around well, and say, Well, I don't know. Let me tell you about our village. <laughs> did you, did um, you the you parents, when I came, there was some upheaval with the parents, you know, mm -hmm. when I came. And I, I did a lot of listening and a lot of trying to structure a way that they could communicate and give feedback, um, mm -hmm. you know, like looking at the site council. Uh, community breakfasts, uh, just a lot of one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Really OJT, on-the-job yeah, yeah. kind of training. So um, I would say their problems were not immediate. There were problems that had been there for a long mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that the district had tried to address a lot of those problems mm -hmm. along the mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. But systemic problems that are long have been there a long time, it is not a quick fix. It takes really a long time. Just like I think there's some really great things yeah. going mm -hmm. on right now, mm -hmm. but there are also probably some areas that didn't get yeah. tapped that yeah. will, yeah. It's, it's a landmine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wait till mm -hmm. the next win mm -hmm. and it'll come up. But I think that what I think was great about what I did is I think I brought 
the attention to the people of what mm-hmm. needs to be mm-hmm. done and how it needs to be done. And I think that's a good thing. And I tried to inspire the students and we had a lot of winning and mm-hmm. we still had a lot of students that didn't win. Mm-hmm. So how do you get every student to win all the time and across the bar? I'm not 100% sure, but what I do know for sure is if there's mentoring and if there's um, the teachers are teaching structured lesson, giving mm-hmm. feedback to the students and parents, mm-hmm. parent engagement, working uh, on what are the graduation requirements, a lot of staff development for the teachers, assessing those students, looking at all the issues, what the kids need to to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you will begin to ga- engage in a lot of uh, collaborative work. And I, I think that is going on at Jefferson now. And I think it was starting to happen in the past. Mm-hmm. And they've done it before. But one of the things that happened is there's always such a huge change going on all yeah. the time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I think that's an issue. Well, you know, the, when I met you, I mean, I, 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 noted, I noted the enthusiasm that you had yeah. with the school. I mean, you your, your, your kids won a championship. That the three, times, three the times, the boys. Three boys times, two girls, times girls, you know, you yeah. Had the girls all involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had community involved. You had the business community involved. Yeah. And naturally, we had you on the show. On, and that, I think that, more than know, one time. Oh, very much right. so. Mm-hmm. And, you, and you do need more time. You know, you need time. You just can't just... Well, it's not only way. time. I think you need management. I think management. I see people coming in, throwing things and, and not really talking about the issues. Okay. And a lot of political hands in the pot. I think mm. you have to have the leadership of the principal be the leader. You can't have everybody being the leader. Mm. And I think when you have too many leaders, the strongest political mm-hmm. link will be the winner. Mm-hmm. So um, those are some of the issues. And well, let me um, ask you a question. I got to ask you this question. You're not going to ask this question. What what impact did a charter school, if you will, that was basically, i.e., focusing? if you will, on minorities within the same community where, where, on the other hand, you had a major school like a Jefferson High School, a public school, that was basically, their focus was, in all, in all due respect, to educate these kids. Mm-hmm. They, they didn't have a... They didn't Which charter school are you speaking well, of? Well, actually, no, SEI. Oh, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm trying to get... What impact did it have on, uh, on what you were trying to do at Jefferson High um, School? That's a hard question um, because um, we SEI can hold, we can hold off, has but. been in the community for a very long okay. time, a very strong partner of Jeff. One yeah. of the thoughts that I've always had is why not make Jefferson High School SEI High School there you go. and then yeah. let them really work that piece, pour a lot of money in that and give them the strength of it because I think they what really, I don't know, that would be my thought about it. Was that? Um, okay. That would be my thought about it. Um, I don't know that right, everybody right. would agree with that because right, it would right. really mean giving that leverage over yeah, to SCI. But I think if they care so much for the community, any 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 organization that's been in the community that long mm-hmm. doesn't need to be competitive. It right. needs to be given authority exactly. to do what they need to do. And, and so, they were a force. If yeah, it, they absolutely. Force I just, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, they're definitely yeah. a partner, definitely a force, definitely with power. Sometimes conflict if you got two it, Right, because if you got two power bases, yeah, yeah. you know, it's something's going to give. Some got so, to, some got but to give. that's how, you know, as a person like me who's a newcomer to the community, right. my grandmother wasn't here, yeah, my parents right, aren't right, here, right, I'm right. in here doing the work. Right, right. But the people who are going to be here for a long period of time, they need to have the greatest yes, say yes. for generations. And so I would say, they're a powerful group, and you know, just um, well, you now have a following, trust me. Yeah, you yeah. Did, you've done some good work. Here. Thank you, you've done some good work. Thank and that's you why so you're much. Here. Okay, look, well, we're gonna we're gonna follow up on some other things. I, I want to ask you some other things. Are you gonna but, save them for next time? Yeah, for next week, okay. Yeah, next week, you're gonna be back on okay. here because we're gonna talk about some other things, whatever. But before we leave, we got about another minute or so. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about what you're doing right now. Okay, you got some things going well, right now. on uh, what are you doing Friday, right now? um, Dr. Okay, Jay right. Kluski and I are doing building school communities from the inside out and I don't know okay. if we can hold this up but uh, we're going to be talking about the MO scale which is a way to understand behavior okay. and build morale in the school oh, really? and what I will be talking about is parental engagement okay. and fundraising I'll be giving a lot of strategies um, there is a cost of $195 okay. but you can go to jkluskey.com yeah. okay. and click on building school communities okay so we're excited, and we hope uh, there will be some administrators who want to reflect. And there's a phone reflect. number there, too. Yeah, there is a phone number, 
Two eight six four, and I don't know if we can hold this up. How about you? How about you? No, no, they can't see that. They can't see it. I don't think so. Okay, five zero three seven five seven eight nine six zero. Yeah, because you want to make sure. And my email is on um, the screen there. It's on the screen. Yeah, Yeah. put that on the screen now, folks. Okay. Okay. So we're excited, and um, we hope people will come out and just reflect on what the school year meant to them, what their leadership. And who who are you focusing to? Uh, We're focusing on um, leaders in the making. Okay. Principals, community engagement people. Anyone that wants to make a difference in a school or in their community, okay. these are the people that we want to work with. So, so i.e., uh, school districts. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then the other thing we're doing is we're doing a community piece for Bishop Wells, well. a free workshop for the parents and guardians and teens, Saturday, June 16th from 3 to 5. Okay. New skills for a new time. Okay. And that's going to be at the Manual Church, 1033 North Sumner Street. Okay. And so they can email me saying... And let me know. And that's something that Bishop Wells wants to do for the community. Okay. At no cost. So oh, wow. that's free. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's great. And so we do these workshops for parents um, all year long. Every month we do a workshop. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, Dr. Harris, you're a busy person. Thank you. You were a busy person when I first met you. And you're busy still now. busy. <laughs> yeah. And, I'm looking and, for that other big job. <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing that really, really excites me and, and I respect you highly for is the fact you didn't leave. You stayed in the community. Yet. <laughs> Yeah, but you in the community. Well, we, I wanted to we because I wanted to um, You've got all see this and knowledge hear, and background. you know, like, what is that about? Because I don't think it's just me. I think that's a process yeah, that Oregon yeah, uses. Yeah. And so maybe I could be instrumental in helping them to be more humane in yeah, how right, they right, deal right, with right. It's people they bring well, to the community. trust me, you are a factor because in all due respect, I mean, we've been talking about this. I mean, it's sort of like beating this can down the road. Yeah. On and the I'm, I'm looking at um, Rudy Crew, and I'm wondering, um, you know, I just Rudy really, Crew. Yeah, we're going to talk yeah, about that next really week. Yeah, I just really hope Rudy he'll Crew. have a good experience and he will yes. not be knocked to the curb because yes. we know this happens here. So I think one of the uh, conversations that I'm hoping I can impact is um, transitioning with love. You know, like if you don't like how something's going, have a conversation. Right. Um, I think this is one of the few places that can happen. Okay, mm-hmm. all right. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to follow up on the Rudy oh, Crew yes, thing please. on next week. Yes, because, that's my... Uh, this, this, I want to congratulate this him. Part, <laughs> right. We want to kind of, because we're going to take advantage of it, we're yeah. going to give him a sort of a little insight yeah. of what's happening within Absolutely. the district and, and some of the background, some of the things that you were yeah, doing. it's been my pleasure to be here. Well, hey, this has been great. Thank and you. And thank you, Dr. Harris. And please stick around. Keep the enthusiasm going. My pleasure. I will see you next week, oh, right? My, next week. Same yeah, time, same, same time, place. Same time, same place. Always a pleasure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, folks, we'll be right back. We'll take a short break, and we'll be back with our next guest. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Okay, folks, we're back again. Uh, this is the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host, and hopefully you will also share with um, uh, share with your neighbors and others about the fact we're on YouTube now. And so, if you don't have, if your neighbors don't have Comcast or this, that, and the other, but hey, they've got a laptop or they got a computer, or whatever, they can access these shows anytime they want. And if you've forgotten anything that you might have said, well, gee whiz, I wish. I wish I, had, I wish I had not gotten that, that cup of tea or that cup of coffee because I missed something. Guess what? You can go to YouTube. You can look at it over and over and over. 
And just to give you an idea as to why you, I'm sharing this with you is because in this particular segment, uh, just like the first segment, this is a very important piece. Farming in the city. How about that? Farming in the city. I mean, we're constantly talking about obesity, eating right, and things of that nature, getting involved in community and things of that nature. Well, I've got two people here uh, that are going to share some things with you and, uh, and be prepared to write down the notes. If not that, visit the YouTube. One of which, by the way, that actually does the farming, if you will, and the other of which is sort of like in the business atmosphere aspect of it that's actually created a business as a result of that to a certain degree. So there's a lot of goodies there to be, be had in this. So we're just going to get right into, right into this, this piece, and you'll learn a little bit more about what, what the things that I'm trying to learn more about, too. I want to know where I can pick up some fresh whatever. you got Saturday markets. you got all kinds of goodies. But these areas are basically developing the community, cleaning up dirty lots, if you will, and things of that nature, and, and doing, making community kinds of events and things of that nature. I think it's a really great idea. And, uh, and then this other person, like I say, is an entrepreneur, and I like that idea because they're, uh, they're selling products, if you will, that, that will be of benefit to you health-wise and whatever. Okay, with that, I'm going to interview, this is the person I've got, let's see, Better Bean. Boy, that's an interesting piece. Better Bean, Hannah Coburg. That's Hannah. This is Hannah right here. She's she's identified as the the bean queen, but I think Dad's part of the deal too, right? Yeah, Dad's that's part. A big she part. she's the business part of the side of aspect of it. You will probably see a see a piece on the um, on the screen there in terms of how to co contact her, but uh, that's the, she's the business side. And then the other person, he happens to be a farm director. His name is Tim Donovan. Okay, Project Grow. Mm -hmm. That's that's the that's the Project Grow. Okay, and that's a very interesting piece. I was just talking to him a little bit before we got on the on the set aspect of it. Very unique, just basically taking an empty lot, so to speak, cleaning it all up, and then basically farming right here there in the go. city. Okay, so why don't we start off? We, let's get the product first before we talk about the business <laughs> side of this piece aspect. Tim, let's take. Hey. Um, so yeah, like you were saying, what's your background first off? How did you get into this business? Background uh, in toxicology. That was my educational wow. background, okay. and then uh, and then organic farming was organic. my okay. professional background. So locally, so, uh, yeah, up in up in uh, Puget Sound region, up in Washington, up in the Washington yeah, area, Helsing Junction Farm. And then you came to Portland. And then I came to Portland. How, how long yeah. was that ago? Uh, that was two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. Yeah. And did you jump right into this piece, or did pretty you... much? Yeah, I was working at a nursery for a little while, and then in local nursery, local nursery over in Mississippi, and then uh, uh, the woman that started Project Grow came in and started talking about it when it was still just a concept, and you got excited. I, 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 I let her poach me from cool, from cool. All right, sounds to, great. Okay, to okay. Do that, so, so what yeah. was your first project? First project there, um, you know, that the the classic idea about farming in the city is this, you know, the kind of after school special uh, mm -hmm. idea of all mm -hmm. the everybody getting together and cleaning up the you know right. dirty lot and, right. and using it, and then we we did that, and that was great. We had an EPA brownfield and and helped uh, with with. The help that had been done previously of remediating the soil, getting a bunch mm -hmm. of the lead out of there, we converted that into a growing space. So we have uh, that was like an eighth of an acre, so very tiny. Okay. Um, and then from there, we we proved that that was working for us. We were able to uh, employ adults with disabilities that had previously not mm. been able to do uh, work like that out in the community. And uh, after that, we'd proved proven that the concept is sound; it works. And other neighbors that had some lots that they weren't using. Uh, allowed us to start start farming on them so it's picking up on the momentum that we had from the first lot we gathered a second lot uh, at the end of our first year a third the next year and then uh, the most recent uh, project which is uh, separate from project grow but but involved is the albinic cooperative garden and mm. that's over on legacy emmanuel's mm. property on russell and vancouver okay. and it's a, a, a almost an acre itself and oh, really? the, the hope there is to through the same process transform the site into Productive farmland, and then make sure that the vegetables get and out. And this is a nonprofit, I take it. Yeah, this is well. This is uh, under under the auspices of okay. uh, Project Grow at Port City, okay. and okay. Uh, and then I, in the future, we'd like to make sure that it's it's self sufficient mm -hmm. and can carry itself mm -hmm. on um, with uh, as a community directed. Okay. So what kind project. of crop do we have here? What, what, what are you growing in there? <laughs> we we've let's see. Last year we did over a hundred fifty varieties. Okay. Um, so the, so you know twenty different tomato varieties, lots of peppers. Uh, about every green you could think about, um, beans, peas. Uh, we've got chickens for eggs. We've got goats. We got for chickens on the yeah. same lot. You got the yep. uh, got uh, oh. goats for fiber. 
Um, got some honeybees. Really? Right, really? right now we got some fish, so we're starting up with. Uh, we'll get some. You cat- got a pond in that deal? We got a little, What's a little, a little, a little tank. pond. Exactly. We got any cat cat fish. Fish. catfish in there? Catfish is good. The, I might, I might consider buying some of those. Gotta say catfish because <laughs> the Department of Fish and Wildlife will get mad at you if you grow anything else. Oh, oh is that right? <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna have some catfish in there. Just got goldfish now, but mm-hmm. trying to trying to have as as uh, you know diverse amount of product as as we can get on the site because we do a, a CSA, which is community supported agriculture. People. Okay. Okay. Sign up at the beginning of the year, get a box every week, oh, really? uh, and then um, try to make sure there's a, a, a good variety so people can make a couple different meals out mm-hmm. of that. So it's not just all lettuces, mm-hmm. or not just all kale, or not just all collards, or something mm-hmm. like that. So mm-hmm. there's there's a diversity. So there. you work with the food bank and currents with the food bank. Um, you know, we 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 love the work that the food bank is doing. I think in terms of food justice in the mm-hmm. city, there's few organizations that could really hold a candle to them, um, and. Uh, We've gotten some starts from them in the past. Cool, uh, yeah. but, you makes know, sense. At, at this point, I think we're we're, we're we, we kind of figured out what works for us, and, right. and uh, we're doing a little, a tiny little thing, and they're doing this big, huge thing, and we're just trying to do what we do uh, better and better and more efficiently. I want I want to remind you that uh, a local organizer actually created the whole concept of the food bank. Did That's, you know that? No, no. Tell me, Clara Peoples. Clara Peoples. Yeah, Clara Peoples. Uh, she was going to Bethlehem e. Church, and uh, she felt she wanted to feed the poor in the area across the board. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what she did, she just went out and just started going from stores to the Fred Myers and all the others and just picking up the leftovers and going to the farmers and, and anywhere and everywhere she can get food. And she'd come back and she just basically went and went in the lots and the, the church's lots mm-hmm. and told people to come on in and get the food. Yep, Clara Peoples. She's still yeah. living Powerful today. Powerful name. Yeah, Miss Clara Peoples. In fact, uh, at one point in time, we were trying, I was working with her at one point in time, we tried to make it the, i.e., rather, rather than the food bank, we was going to call it the, the People's Bank. Love it. it made a lot of sense to me, it does. but unfortunately, the politics cut us off. Uh-huh. Uh, but but I know with you here now, and 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 now with uh, this young lady, this Kohlberg here, we we might put something together, right? That sounds good. All right, good enough. So keep talking. All right. Um, so with the uh, the Albanic uh, Cooperative Garden, uh, the idea there is there's a lot of community gardens around town. The traditional model is. I rent a little square, you rent a little square, you rent a little square, okay. and you've got different people renting okay. boxes, and, that, and sometimes that works amazingly. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of time, I, I'd even hazard to say most of the time, it doesn't work that well to actually feed people. Um, there's, there's wonderful exceptions to that, but for the idea with the cooperative garden is that we build, have the community build a little bit tighter there. So everybody's working together, there's not individually rented plots, we've got this big open space, almost an acre. That everybody has access to, so we you know we talk as a group and say we want to grow this 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 and this and you know I have this one special variety that my grandma had I want mm-hmm. to grow that sure, make sure everybody has things that they want to be growing and not want to be eating, and then we'll do harvests together, package it up, give it out to everybody equally. So mm-hmm. you know if everybody that's in, involved, there's never a lack of produce with and the then, garden. It's always yeah. too much. Right, like the right, food bank. right. There's always too much food, mm-hmm. um, so nobody's going to get ripped off. Uh, mm-hmm. And when we have that many people, um, it doesn't take very much money to sustain the whole right. place. Mm-hmm. We got a mm-hmm. grant to, to put this thing in. We don't need to make money this year, so it's free membership. Uh, people come in. Who gave you the grant? Uh, this is a Bureau of Environmental Services. This is, it was passed down. <laughs> it's like the, the community garden that couldn't find a home for a long time. And then mm-hmm. now, um, with a partnership with Legacy Emanuel Medical Center okay. uh, and okay. Elliott Neighborhood Association, yeah, there you go. Uh, it's 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 moving. So mm-hmm. uh, the idea there is is we involve as many people as want to want to want to be involved, but ideally people that otherwise wouldn't have access to this food. So it's, so it doesn't cost mon- us money to produce it. Um, nobody's making money off of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to have a ton of extra produce. Why don't we get it to people that otherwise couldn't get it? Uh, so the so the hope is people could come in and put in really just maybe a, an hour a week. That's that's what we're looking for. It's not going to take much more than that for mm-hmm. watering, weeding. Uh, the, when it's when it's that big and things are spaced apart easily, not, you're not trying to crowd everything you want to eat the entire mm-hmm. season into one little box. Uh, the maintenance is pretty pretty uh, mellow. So so we'll have. Hopefully, people come and do an hour a week. If they can't do that, mm-hmm. you're going to make up for it. I'm sure mm-hmm. it's good with uh, what with I love good most will. about the cooperative garden is that one person can water it all. That's what I have the hardest t- time exactly. with. You yeah. know, I have to go and yeah. water it every single no, time. And if I had my own little garden, I mean, it would yeah. probably mm-hmm. die. But mm-hmm. instead, you can share the exactly. The watering you could tour. go. You could go on vacation, and your yeah. garden is still <laughs> going to be there when you get back. And uh, no. and and. Um, you know, this is going to mean pretty much free food for people. So an hour a week, I know even that is is a lot to ask from for for poor people. 
an hour a week is is that's that's a lot of time you know free free time even if you're unemployed that isn't very free you know that cost that costs a lot and there's a big in, impact there so pretty much whatever people can bring to to contribute to the garden we're hoping to reward with good produce and make sure that people get, uh, get well, rewarded. Tell me that. something. What about in terms of the um, uh, a priority list? Do you have some sense of a, a priority list in terms of a criteria priority you, you list? Know, in terms I, of who can access this kind of a deal? You know, Are they rich or poor or whatever? Cause, uh, um, you know, we're, 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 we we don't have a, a, a super rigorous you know yeah, metric yeah, that people have yeah. to pass. The ideal is people in the neighborhood. Um, people that are close by, because if people go. are close by, they're more likely to come out to it to, to take care of it. Yeah. If you, you know, with with uh, somebody from Northwest that wants to come over, you know, it, it's always hard to say no to somebody. But to to think that somebody's going to have to be driving twenty minutes, mm-hmm. biking twenty minutes to get over to take care of something mm-hmm. for ten minutes, just doesn't seem like it would shake out that well for them. Mm-hmm. So people that are close would be would be fantastic. There's a lot of wonderful nonprofits around the uh, um, the garden that that we're you know, working with to try to get some involvement in, um, okay. you know, trying try to make sure that people want the food, that are actually going to eat the food, because mm-hmm. uh, we just don't, we don't want to have a lot of members that end up thinking it's a great idea because they read about it and it's hot yeah. and they heard Michael Pollan well, they've, they've got some charity markets, they've got other venues, you know, that yeah. people can access, you know, whatever. Yeah. I was just thinking in terms of community, that we, it is community. The, we, we, want, we want this to have as little, as little of, you know, no middleman. Right. Pe- people come in, get their food, that's okay. it. You know, it right. does, people don't have to come out to meetings, people are not going to have to come out and uh, we're not going to have three weeks of discussions about the the mission statement. Okay. The, the hope is people get fed good food that's grown well in the city and for, for, Cheap or free. Okay. But let's say if a person outside of the area owns property there, like an empty lot yeah. or something like that, can they contribute it to this program? Uh, there's there, there's no no end of possibilities mm-hmm. that Pseudo 70 okay. offers land up. <laughs> what, what if they don't have any property but they have some money? Is it they'd like to just go in and contribute? Can then they do that? They, they, we'd love that. Actually, we were, we were hoping to have uh, you know basically scholarships uh, oh, offered okay. so that people could uh, subsidize the cost of somebody you know, being typically, involved. Typically, people with money want to write it off on taxes. Can exactly. they write it off? They can. Can You, you can give them that, that sanction? Okay, Indeed. that sounds great. Well, look, why don't we do this? Why don't we get Hannah involved in this deal now as, a, as, a, yeah. as an entrepreneur? I have you a few want questions, questions just about yeah. the... Well, let's talk about your business first. We, we, we'll <laughs> okay. get back to him. we got a few okay. more minutes here. I want to make sure we get your piece in it. How'd you get yeah. in this business? I uh, moved home. Moved home. Oh. <laughs> I live with my dad. And oh. these um, these beans were definitely my father's idea. I come I come more from actually... A, uh, I learned how to farm out in New York. I grew up here, but went out east um, and went to school, studied food systems, studied farming, really, oh, really? cared about this stuff. Oh, wow. And um, saw a perfect opportunity to work with my father. Actually, I mean, I saw him working really, really hard and mm-hmm. realized that he needed my help. Oh, wow. Um, and because it's no joke starting a food company well, or you, a restaurant. Well, he sent you to school. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's from... <laughs> you're back. You're back here. now. Yeah. But, you're, but you're back now. That's a good idea. Yeah. Good, good time. So now you've helped him. How long have you guys been mm-hmm. in this business? Uh, three years. Three years. So it's, yeah, pretty new. Um, we rent commercial kitchen space down in Wilsonville. Okay. And um, we try and use local ingredients from producers, but one of the, the issues that we were talking about earlier before yeah. we came in here is that um, kind of one of the main gaps in the local food movement food food scene is the gap between those who grow the food mm-hmm. and those who cook it and prepare it because the expectation for a product like ours or a meal at a at a sandwich shop you know the price expectation is pretty low so okay. pe- you know people because of because the industrial food system has really low you know tight margins or whatever and and, mm-hmm. and corn is subsidized right, all these, right, right, yeah, all right. that um we're, you know, our products being compared to a, you know, meal at McDonald's. Mm-hmm. And it's like, mm-hmm. well, you know, why would I, I do, yeah. why would I, you know, yeah. why would I pay so much huh. for, for your product versus, mm-hmm. you How know, do you overcome that? Well, we talk, we talk about our product. We talk about, you know, what we're doing and our values and in terms of, in terms of sourcing, but then also, you know, treating our workers well and et cetera. But it's really, people are realizing that they need to get on board board with local food because it is going to be the jump start to our economy i believe the county just did a study multnomah county that if um currently in the metro area we are consuming five percent local food if we Mm -hmm. just increase that by one percent we that would be a 20 million dollar net benefit for the region uh, because job creation job creation money stays local um Mm -hmm. you know 
we've we've created five jobs you know <laughs> mm-hmm. we work hard but you know there are you know there there are small jobs and um but it's it's more about the fact that then I spend my money here mm-hmm. in the in the community and mm-hmm. that just okay. doesn't doesn't mm-hmm. leave and go go somewhere else how do you go about uh, defining selected products for selecting a product if you will oh to how do you do oh that? gosh to sell our chili that yeah. we we came chili. out we were like we need to have a chili mm-hmm. we spent a year reformulating it, just tasting it. But we go with farmers markets and say, "Hey, how do you guys like this? What mm. do you think? What do you think of it? Do you, mm. you know, what 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 do you want? What do you do? And mm. how do you make your chili? Mm-hmm. You know, really learning from our customers and the you know the community going but, but online. Is it, but is the around. processing of that chili cumbersome still? Because a lot of times you think about regulations. You got to do the fed, the meat, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're all vegan and gluten free, so okay. that helps us a lot, okay. you know, in terms of, of regulations. But no, food safety is huge, and yeah. um, we've you know invested a lot of money and time in studying mm-hmm. food safety, and then also um, developing food safety systems. And you know, we're still really small, so we can manage that pretty easily. Mm-hmm. But you you know, the bigger you get, there's just so many more regulations involved. And actually, what happens, um, and kind of what most companies opt for is. To mechanize, and mm-hmm. that means job loss. Mm-hmm. Actually, yeah, yeah. Right? It's like they want you know just have less people involved because mm-hmm. they think you know human error, mm-hmm. um, and so. You see any comes. opportunities maybe in this particular program as far as raw products? We, um, I had a long conversation with Inger McDowell of the Urban League. She just got some land out at. Um, at Foster, and they were saying she, like, "Can we grow you your tomatillos? We use a ton of tomatillos." in in our product and we had to have a really frank conversation about it we pay a dollar a pound for tomatillos for someone to put in the you know sweat labor organic tomatillos um, they probably want more like five dollars a pound for Mm -hmm. for the tomatillo and so that's i mean that's the gap that we need to can he grow them not, to, not enough and and not cheaply enough. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so that's a gap. Sadly. I mean, we're, we're trying to close. Maybe we might be able to subsidize because he's got a, you know, the nonprofit piece. Like might we, be able... we might be able to do peppers. Those things peppers. that pack peppers. like a little bit more punch. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's, we should talk about that um, opportunity. Our, one of um, the cooks and the guys who does farmer's markets for us, he's in the beginning urban farmer apprenticeship mm-hmm, program mm-hmm. through the county. And he just created a crop plan for us so that we could work with a local farmer mm. to um, grow. And so we need 14 acres, um, actually 16 acres, 14 of which are in beans. The rest are peppers and tomatillos. Mm-hmm. Um, and to really work through this plan and really think about, um, we're, we're, that's where we're, we're at right now is changing how, thinking about how we make our product and going from using, we use fresh peppers right now, mm-hmm. going to getting them all from one farm and freezing them. And, yeah. you know, having it be, you know, maybe we can have some some money savings in just dealing with them in bulk rather okay. than getting them every week okay. from a food okay. service distributor. You got enough time now. <laughs> you, had, you had a couple questions you wanted to ask. So. Oh, yeah. I was interested um, in the model of, of, of having scholarships for the cooperative garden. Um, I worked with a, a farm, again, back in Poughkeepsie, New York, and they had subsidized uh, shares, but kind of one thing that they noticed in it was that if they offered it for free, mm-hmm. that um, there's you know kind of a people took it for granted and yep. didn't show up every week to pick up their share, and so they really said just give me two dollars, you know, mm-hmm. for your, for your share. Absolutely. But then also there's you know the whole movement that um, Sisters of the Road has really mm-hmm. pioneered with you know dining with dignity, and that it's not like you know recognizing that people do have some income and Absolutely. resources, mm-hmm. you know, for trade or, you know, and it's not just, you know, because I think that's one of the the issues with the, f- the food bank model, though, is like, you know, take the food because you can't get anything else, you know. No, I, th- I think that uh, people, it's hard to get over taking something for granted when it's free. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. It, it's it's a, you, you think about it objectively, it seems like it's just a win-win, but people don't take it as seriously, put as much stock into it or think it's as mm-hmm. valuable. Um, the first year that we're doing the, the cooperative garden, we're not charging anybody anything because we don't know what a fair price would be. Until the end of the mm-hmm. year when we've tracked all of our costs and mm-hmm. how much fertilizer costs, how much our, our seeds starts, uh, soil, all that st- stuff that we're going to need to use each year. Until we figure out how much that costs, we'll take that, see what our maximum membership is, take our f- total cost, divide by maximum membership, and figure out exactly what covering the costs is going to be. Mm-hmm. It's going to end up being cheap. 
Um, mm-hmm. so, so for this first year, we're not charging anybody anything. So, so, mm-hmm. so with that, we want to make sure that we attract people that are interested in the work, people that are interested in the product, and so that we cut out a lot of the other problems people run into it of like, I don't, you know, I don't have that much time this, this year, I don't know how much I can commit. Mm-hmm. Come in, come to as many work parties as you can, come to as many harvests as you can. Um, for for, for the, the scholarship end of thing, if there was a, a nonprofit that wanted to be involved in the garden, you know, if, if NARA, for instance, right up the street from us, uh, if, you know, if the Urban League or if African American Health Coalition on, mm-hmm. on Legacy Emanuel's property, Wanted to have you know three three people that were in the program seemed very um, uh, appropriate to, to work on the on the the garden, but they didn't have anything in their budget. But they wanted to offer it as part of their programming. That would be really easy for 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 a business that had some money, like the um, Rose Quarter. Um, uh, the Blazers were interested in in helping out if they could. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's that's an ability for. For them, it's you get like this all the ball like, players out on the land th- doing. That's the dream. Things. That's the dream. Yeah, yeah. get them to do yeah. the really hard yeah. work. We had the, we had the, we had the <laughs> navy training. out last week, and uh, <laughs> that the 15, fifteen people from the navy got done. But mm-hmm. um, it seems like it would have taken about a hundred <laughs> people mm-hmm. from the neighborhood mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. 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 So this is more of a community effort type yeah, thing. Yeah, you know, exactly. This is not a job creation thing. No, you know, just no. This is about food. Getting involved and i.e. right within the vicinity routine and meeting and. All these other good, which which is good because that mm-hmm. that builds good solid community, which exactly is, uh, the village or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I like that idea. But there is something we do need to think about. You know, how do we create good jobs through mm-hmm. our food system? And and it's tough. I mean, oh, no, there's well, well you in the business. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as you grow, as you develop, you know, you're gonna be creating jobs. But mm-hmm. I mean, it's costly. I mean, you got minimum wage or better. You got mm-hmm. you got technical better. support. You got this. You got that. And then by the time you price that product, I mean that all has to reflect. Definitely, yeah. And, and then the and then if you know, you were to grow food too yeah. locally, yeah. In the, you know, yeah. in the city, what you know, well, I, I actually an example from the business is we were talking to some farmers in California to grow us beans, and they basically mm-hmm. said we can't grow beans because they don't have a high enough market value mm-hmm. to grow them. We need to grow higher value crops like to- tomatoes and you know basil. You mm-hmm. were saying earlier, and you know, kind of you know thinking carefully about what you grow and what you know what the market value is really for those things but you know it can can people make a living growing food in the city mm-hmm. outside of the nonprofit model um i don't know i don't think so <laughs> and 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 people are very excited about about yeah, urban yeah. farming and it's the hot thing it's you can't you can't turn on the radio without hearing something right, about it right, right. um but the reality of it is it's it's hard to grow a lot of food in the city um we should focus on on Using that food uh, for as much leverage as possible to get people thinking about healthier eating okay. choices. Yeah. Well, hey, look, look like we're at the end of the deal, Wonderful. but hey, this has been great. It's been very informative. We really thank appreciate you so much that for the information us. is out there, and Love and it. this is really great. And thank both great. of you. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Take care. And as George Page always said, folks, back to what you believe in. We'll see you later. Have a good one.